Good afternoon, friends. On behalf of Center for the Study of Developing Societies, uh, I, Hilal Ahmed, would like to welcome you uh, on this occasion of a special seminar by Professor Clifford Bob uh, on a very interesting topic, uh, which is usually uh, not taken uh, very seriously in our discussion. And that is about the concept of rights. Uh, the title which he is given uh, for his talk, it's called Rights as Weapon, Instrument of Conflict and Tools of Power. Professor Bob is a professor of political science at De Quince University. He is currently a full bright global scholar and he is at the moment researching civil society responses to COVID policies. Uh, his recent book, which is uh, the, the today's lecture is based on that book. It's called Right as Weapons. It is published in 2019 by Princeton University Press. Uh, he's also an author of two award-winning books. One it is called The Global Right Wing, published in 2012 uh, by Cambridge University Press, and it won the International Studies Association Book of the Decade Award. And his another book that was published in 2005, The Marketing of Rebellion, published by Cambridge University Press, and that also won ISA Best Book Award. So we do hope that this book will also get another award. Uh, so we are really looking forward for this lecture because in this uh, lecture, I suppose that you are going to offer an alternative framework to study rights. So over to you, Professor Bob. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh you're all being here. I'm sorry that I'm going to sort of be looking at the camera, people online and not back at you, but uh, it's a little awkward, but I think it'll work well. Um, yes, uh, let me just go to some of the slides I want to share here. Um, I, hmm, let's see, a little bit further on than we need to be. Okay, yeah, so uh, this is a book that I published in 2019, as um, Hillel just said. And um, it is a book that does try to present a different view of how rights actually work in politics, both nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will, in this talk, present kind of an outline of the entire book, uh, but obviously much uh, abbreviated. So I will start by just quickly going over some of the key ways in which human rights and rights generally have been conceived previously in political science and international relations, as well as in law. Um, then I'll present an alternative theory, which I call the rights as weapons approach, focusing on three different ways in which rights are used in aggressive ways. Uh, first, to mobilize constituents and allies in a particular rights campaign. Uh, Second, deployed as weapons against foes of the campaign. And third, I'll look at the way in which those foes try to repulse or fight back against the campaigns, uh, often using rights as their own weapons against the original campaign. I will present two short case studies as well as just uh, very capsule uh, examples in the presentation. Those case studies are on the women's rights uh, and their usages by the US in the Afghanistan war and on LGBT rights in, in Africa. And I'll then make a few conclusions and open it up to questions. So to, just to start, um, I believe that uh, the conventional way in which uh, philosophers, uh, many political scientists, international relations uh, experts have looked at human rights uh, has a number of different components. First, rights are often viewed as entitlements that all of us have by virtue of being human. Um, this is a, a very much a normative definition of rights in my view. I'm gonna present a more empirical one later, uh, but the claim is that human rights are things that 
every human being has simply by virtue of being human. And the focus in the scholarship that takes this approach is typically on the rights holder uh, and how the rights holder deserves and sometimes tries to achieve its, or his or her rights. In this view as well, rights are typically seen as primarily a end or goal of politics. And in some cases, almost as the key goal that um, uh, all politics swirls around, increasing rights among various different populations. Um, from the international legal standpoint, um, one of the key ways or one of the key ideas uh, that is also discussed is that rights are primarily shields used to defend the interests of the powerless, as Michael Ignatieff, a uh, Canadian scholar and political candidate, uh, said in one of uh, his important books back in the late 1990s. And I think this is a view that's often shared by other IR scholars and international legal scholars. Um, along with that is the view promoted pr primarily by the United Nations that all human rights are indivisible, that any uh, attempt to increase one particular right is uh, going to work hand in hand with the increase of all other rights. And so there's no real conflict between rights. At least that's the concept the UN puts forward in claiming that all human rights are indivisible. Finally, um, another of the more, I'd say, conventional views of human rights focuses on their his history and uh, often sees the rise of human rights as an inevitable aspect of history and a kind of a unidirectional increase in rights around the world. Uh, most famously, I think Francis Fukuyama put this kind of idea forward in his End of History uh, book back in the early 1990s, immediately after the end of the Cold War. I think he's actually kind of moved away from that uh, view more recently, uh, but still, uh, I think that is a very important part of the conventional view of human rights. Now, I, in my book, tried to come up with an alternative view of human rights. And in doing so, I tried to start with an empirical rather than a normative definition of rights. Um, and in looking in the literature for some ideas about how to define a right, I found back in the early 20th century, Wesley Hofeld, one of the most famous American jurists of his day, uh, defining rights in the following way, which I think is purely an empirical way of doing so. That is, uh, a right would be the ability of one entity, the rights claimant, to enforce a duty on another, who we can call the duty bearer. And the rights claimant could do this directly, uh, directly against a particular, let's say an individual directly against another individual, or more commonly in society, this would be done indirectly through institutions, particularly courts, that would vindicate the rights of one uh, claimant against some other entity, including the state, of course. Uh, so these entities can include individuals and groups, groups that might include the state, but also could include various identity groups. I would also just add to this definition that using Ho Hofeld's and kind of definition I adopt, uh, using that definition, rights and their uh, associated duties can relate to or include any type of political goals. They're not simply confined to what are typically seen as human rights in the international legal sphere. Now, using that empirical definition of rights, I then developed what I call the rights as weapons approach, which I see as very much a purely political rather than a normative view of rights. Um, and in looking at this, um, Rights, the idea of rights as weapons, I claim to the conventional view that uh, rights should be viewed primarily as the achievements of political struggle, uh, not as entitlements that all of us have simply by virtue of being human. Uh, 
Uh, that's more a claim that might be made in a rights struggle. But from the more empirical and political standpoint, uh, rights are the achievements, uh, are achievements that we um, reach through political struggle. Uh, and rights, including human rights, do impose duties on others. So importantly, those duty bearers often oppose rights claimants yeah. because in fact, they don't want to assume new du duties. Uh, those duties might reduce their own power or force them to do things that they don't want to do. So in this view, the focus should be not on rights holders as such, but on those who are claiming their rights and equally on the, those who are uh, going to be imposed upon with new duties. Um, Secondly, the rights as weapons approach views rights not just as the ends of political conflict or politics more generally, but as means that are used in, in politics and political conflict. And I focus a great deal in the book, and actually I've done this in previous books as well, on rights campaigns uh, and conflicts over rights, epitomized in this photo by one of the most important contemporary rights battles, at least in the United States, over trans rights. Rights are not merely means of politics, though. I would argue that they are often offensive weapons, not simply shields defending the powerless and the weak, but weapons often wielded by political groups that are trying to achieve power, even self-determination, as in these cases. Um, and by very, very powerful entities, including the state itself, as we shall see. A fourth difference between the alternative view that I'm proposing and the more conventional view is that rights are inherently conflictive and by no means indivisible. I sharply challenge the UN view and the view of a number of other of scholars that uh, there is no uh, possibility of conflict between rights, that all rights are indivisible, and instead claim that it's very much a conflictive uh, concept in politics. And we as scholars should view it that way. And just as one example, that battle over trans rights is truly a battle with many in the uh, sphere of fem feminist politics, women's rights champions actually opposing trans rights, indicating again that there is no, nothing indivisible about rights. Finally, in terms of the historical side of things, which I'm not gonna talk about too much here, but I will at least allude to, I would argue that rights rise is not inevitable. It's not unidirectional. In fact, it's highly contingent. And rights that we have today are by no means here forever. Uh, one good example of that, just in the news over the last week, is the Supreme Court's apparent draft opinion in the United States saying that uh, the right to abortion may well go by the wayside. We'll see what happens in a few months when they actually release the final decision. But the broader point is that rights are not inevitable uh, and that you can actually see uh, changes, some would say retrogression in rights over time. Now, taking this alternative viewpoint on rights, uh, in my book, I focus on three key aspects of how rights are used in the conflicts that I look at. First, as I mentioned briefly before, rights are used by campaigners, activists, advocates, the state, uh, to uh, mobilize constituents and allies, those who are going to benefit from the particular political goal that the rights campaign is seeking to achieve. And by claiming that a certain political goal is actually a right, even a natural or human right, um, campaigners can bring in constituents and allies to the campaign, strengthening it. A second key aspect of the use of rights is that they are often deployed directly against foes in various ways to weaken the foe and advance the cause of the rights campaign. <clears throat> and the final aspect I'm gonna talk about towards the end is that uh, those foes who are facing rights campaigns often will use uh, their own rights-based methods to fight against the initial campaign. So I'm gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail. 
and then uh, do the look at the take a look at some empirical cases in a bit more detail. <clears throat> so, in terms of mobilizing constituents and allies into a rights-based campaign, one of the most common and oldest tactics that's been used to do this is to claim that rights are natural or human in the US Constitution, and even well before the, the idea that rights are natural was put forward. Um, more frequently today, we hear about rights as human rights, that all humans have rights. Um, but my claim here would be that this is simply, that there is no proof for this. I might well agree with it, uh, that we all should have rights, but in terms of empirical proofs for this, uh, in, in, in terms of exactly what it means to be a natural right or even a human right, uh, there's a lot of vagueness involved. And in fact, the main usefulness of claiming that a right is natural or human is to convince those who are seeking the same political goal to join the campaign. It also, of course, throws the foe, those who will have a new duty put onto them, um, those who oppose the new right, it throws them on the defensive by portraying them as unnatural or even inhuman. So this is a very important and powerful strategy that's often used in rights campaigns. A second claim that's often used is that rights are universal that they transcend all cultures, all nat national borders, and that they can be deployed anywhere in the world. Again, I would say that this is more a claim than an actual fact. Uh, and it's a useful claim as well, especially for those uh, who are facing very strong opponents in a particular context, because by claiming that the rights that you're seeking or that are being violated uh, are actually universal ones, it opens you up for support from people around the world. It in could easily help internationalize a rights-based struggle. So claiming that a right is universal is a very common strategy as well. A third common strategy to mobilize constituents and allies is to claim that rights are apolitical or super political, that they are something that is beyond politics, that no one can really contest. And we've seen this again and again uh, in recent political struggles, um, the claim that you know, we really can't debate, debate this issue because it is a right. Uh, again, I would say this can be a powerful way to mobilize those who already support the political goal that this campaign is seeking. It often doesn't cut very much ice with the opponents uh, because frankly, this is the ultimate political strategy. It's an attempt to take debate away by simply saying that this right is super political. A final way in which um, many rights campaigns seek to mobilize constituents and allies is by claiming that rights are absolute, or at least that the right that that particular claim is seeking, that particular campaign is seeking is absolute. This was a, an argument put forth most uh, famously, I think, by an American uh, legal scholar, Ronald Dworkin, in, in an article and book known as called Rights as Trumps. And he was focusing on individual rights, and he made the claim that uh, rights should trump any other social or economic interest that's out there. Now, I would say that this concept has also been used, even before Dworkin talked of it, uh, in, by other entities, ones that probably Dworkin would shudder at, often in the U.S., and I think more generally internationally, states' rights or the rights of particular um, majorities are viewed as absolute and as being able to uh, suppress the rights of the individual. Um, recently, in the context of COVID, we've seen around the world claims that the rights of the society as a whole to live, to be healthy, to avoid getting COVID, allow the state to declare a state of emergency, 
perpetually, it seems in many cases, continue that state of emergency and do away with many of the democratic processes that we're all familiar with uh, in terms of policymaking and to basic rights that most of us, I think, assumed were going to be present in our lives for the foreseeable future. But this claim that certain types of rights in certain contexts are absolute has been very powerful and powerful not just in suppressing individual rights, but also in mobilizing those who are trying to achieve particular political goals. Now, turning to the second key aspect of, of this uh, view of rights as weapons, uh, rights are not only used to mobilize your own constituency and your own allies, the people who are already sympathetic to your cause, but they are also used very aggressively against foes. And I'm gonna talk about basically five different ways uh, that I uh, look at in the book that, you, that this happens. First, I would say often rights are used as camouflage to conceal other types of agendas. Claims that rights are being violated or that we need to achieve certain types of rights often um, are used to, um, as, as are often kind of veneers uh, over other types of goals. So for instance, in the debate over same-sex marriage and uh, gay rights more generally in the United States, there have been claims, primarily by conservatives, that their religious freedoms, their religious rights are being uh, abused by the rise of uh, gay rights. And the claim, certainly from the other side, is that in fact, this is simply disguised bigotry as that sign in the uh, uh, lower right indicates. In my book, I talk about that case. I also look at uh, briefly at the case of the English Defense League, a very uh, nationalist movement in uh, the UK that um, has, long, has a long-standing sort of anti-Muslim animus. Uh, interestingly, they came up with a campaign that was focused primarily on animal rights. Uh, they suddenly had uh, seemed to have found uh, the need to, to protect animals, uh, but many would claim, and I make the argument as well, that this is not a particularly sincere belief, that instead this is an effort to actually maintain their longstanding anti-Muslim stance in, for instance, this uh, halal campaign that they have, uh, that they conducted a few years back in the name of animal rights. A second way in which rights are deployed against foes, often um, through the courts, is as spears. This is a method in which those who are promoting new rights will target one very egregious specific policy to try to change it um, with the hope that that will then cause much broader societal change. Often it is weak groups who use this, this method because they don't have the capacity to, to uh, attack the broader society uh, all at once uh, and instead will focus only on a single narrow case. Um, and Famous examples of this would be the Brown v. Board of Education uh, case in the 1950s, which was used to desegregate the schools in the South, but was part of a much broader campaign to try to end uh, civil rights violations against African-Americans in the United States. And of course, this was a very successful use of the spear strategy, focusing just on one narrow, uh, vulnerable part of the broad system of segregation in the South, but one that then helped lead to the toppling of a whole range of other types of um, deprivations of rights that African-Americans faced at the time. More recently, again, just over the last few weeks, I think what we're seeing in the um, current challenge to Roe v. Wade, the American abortion case, is another individual specific case aimed simply at ending abortion rights at, at least at the national level. Um, but arguably it's part of a much broader conservative or traditionalist agenda to change the ways in which uh, society deals with women and the family in the United States. I think certainly some of those bringing these kinds of lawsuits have that agenda in the back of their minds. 
I, in the book, focus on a particular case in Italy. This is not, I think, exclusive to the United States, but a case in Italy in which um, a group of uh, atheists, there are atheists in, in Italy, uh, tried to end the longstanding policy of having crucifixes in every public school classroom in Italy. Uh, and they had a lawsuit. They brought a lawsuit making rights-based policies. They were trying on the surface simply to um, get crucifixes out of public school classrooms. But clearly, and I interviewed them uh, about this, clearly their main aim was actually to reduce the power of the Catholic Church in Italy much more broadly. And initially they actually succeeded at the European Court of Human Rights, although ultimately this was reversed on appeal. Now that spear strategy is one that I, I believe is mostly used by relatively weak groups. On the other hand, what I call the dynamite strategy is often used by the most powerful entities in a society to try to attack weaker elements within that society, to try to remake societies wholesale instead of just trying with one specific policy to cause slow and broader change, to actually come in initially and try to undermine uh, what is seen as a, some sort of a threatening part of the society. One example of this I look at briefly in, in my book as well uh, is in France where the uh, majority population, even though it's a very uh, secular society, uh, is, has, has uh, made the wearing of um, the hijab illegal. Uh, and this is seen as certainly by uh, the Muslim, the small Muslim population as a, an effort to undermine their identity and their rights. But from the standpoint of the French state, and I'd say the bulk of the French populace, this is instead seen as a way of protecting their own right to a secular society, which they see as part of their longstanding um, cultural, uh, longstanding French culture, although it actually doesn't necessarily go all, for, all that far back. Another example I look at, and I'll talk about a little bit more in this uh, talk towards the end, is the way in which, in, in international politics, is the way in which the United States has used women's rights to try to uh, maintain for two decades until this year, uh, the war in Afghanistan. Um, and interestingly, the way in which as well, non-governmental organizations who promote human rights have actually tried to perpetuate the war in order to essentially, first of all, help Afghan women, but more generally to remake Afghan society. Another way in which rights are often deployed against foes are as wedge issues, or I call them crowbars as well. To, the effort here is to um, attack a broad-based coalition that you are in a political conflict with by trying to break from that coalition certain parts of, of, the, of the coalition uh, and thereby weakening that coalition. An example here is Israel and various Israeli support NGOs uh, use of gay rights to try to break apart the pro-Palestinian coalition, which includes a wide range of, you call them left-wing groups, including men, many that support gay rights. Uh, Israel points out, and it's actually true, that Israel has much more uh, open, openness to LGBT rights and gay communities than most Muslim uh, countries and including the Palestinian Authority. So, the claim that I make in the book is that these kinds of advertisements that have been put out on the net and in various uh, publications, they've been up in uh, San Francisco uh, as well, are meant, at least in part, yes, to help protect gay men, but also have a very important ulterior goal, namely to wedge apart that broad left-wing coalition, to break away, break perhaps gays, uh, LGBT populations who support Palestinian rights, break them away from that coalition, or more generally break away certain uh, left-wing groups who, who are part of that as well. 
Finally, another deployment of uh, rights that I highlight in the book with each of these, by the way, has a separate chapter if you're interested, uh, is the use of rights as what I call blockades, uh, in which one group that's seeking its rights tries to suppress a weaker third party in order to gain its own rights from some dominant group. An example I look at there is the 19th century suffrage movement for women's rights in the United States. Uh, and what many don't realize is that this suffrage movement was part of a much broader movement for voting rights in 19th century America. It included efforts to gain votes for those without property in the early 19th century. And also importantly, it included a voting rights wing seeking votes for freed African slaves in the North. During the pre-Civil War era, uh, women's rights suffragettes uh, worked uh, to some extent with the African American community jointly to gain uh, votes. But after the end of the Civil War, when African American men were granted the right to vote, but women were not, many of the activists in the late 19th century tried to gain rights for women by claiming if they, those are granted to us, we will overwhelm the African American vote. You should give us rights so that we can help in the repression of a subordinate group, namely African Americans. And this is sort of an underbelly, dark underbelly, if you will, of the women's rights movement in the United States, but it continued right up until uh, votes were granted to women in 1920. Another more contemporary example of the blockade strategy relates again to this new cutting edge rights campaign for trans rights. And that's gained a lot of support, especially in the West, I'm not sure how much here in, in India, but uh, a great deal of support in the, in the West. But as I alluded to a moment ago, it's also attracted a lot of opposition from longstanding feminist movements in the United States and Great Britain and other countries as well who claim that this effort to increase trans rights is actually partially a camouflage for increasing men's rights. But more importantly, it's an effort to block the rights of women. And even they claim to do away with the rights of women as a separate sex. Uh, and even as this book uh, which uh, is written by a number of well-regarded feminists from way back uh, to erase womanhood itself. Um, again, this, has, this is a very controversial issue right now. And these uh, ra feminists who make this claim have been denigrated by trans rights activists as uh, trans exclusionary ra radical feminists or TERFs. But I think it's a good example from my standpoint of the rights as blockade strategy. The final aspect of rights I wanna talk about here is the use of rights by those who are attacked by the rights campaign, an effort to repulse the rights campaign, often using rights arguments again. I just really talked about that example with uh, the radical feminists opposition to trans rights in the name of women's rights. But to add to that, there are a number of key strategies that are used in these repulsion campaigns. <clears throat> First, the foes of a rights campaign will often simply reject or deny the, I the idea that the rights bear the, 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 uh, there are even rights at issue, that the rights bearer, they'll say that the rights bearers claims are simply not rights at all. Here's an example from the very hot debate that we have in the United States, uh, where those who are anti-abortion basically claim that there should be, and there is no real right to have an abortion. Another tactic that's often used is rivalry. 
That is the deployment of a set of contrary rights. And I've already alluded to that, uh, again, with this trans versus women's rights issue, or we could talk about it with regard to women's rights versus uh, uh, the right to life in the abortion issue and the uh, different signs you see in these um, Post in, in these protests uh, from decades back on the left and from uh, just the other day on the right indicate that both sides in conflict after conflict will deploy a set of contrary rights. Um, a third, oops, I guess I've got a slight problem here. Um, a, a, a third strategy is um, reversal to portray one's oneself or one's own group, the foes group, as a victim of the other group's rights. Here's an example, again, very contemporary from uh, at least the United States. I'm not sure how much of a controversy it is in India, but uh, in the US, those who were campaigning to end the use of masks in schools, but also much earlier in just everyday life in many states, um, were of course attacking the often state governments and uh, certain constituencies who believed that masks were protecting them from COVID. Uh, and so those foes of the mask anti-mask campaigns uh, put out posters like this that suggest that um, we are the victims of those who are trying to promote the individual right not to wear a mask. And I think, again, this kind of reversal strategy is quite common in rights conflicts. Final repulsion strategy, if you will, is simply to repudiate any effort to put into place a new right and to defy any defeats that you might have. Uh, one example, and this goes actually to my previous book on the global right wing, uh, is the debate over gun rights in the United States. One that has been portrayed as the right to life and freedom from uh, fear and death from handguns versus the right to bear arms and firearms rights here. Um, in a number of states, there have been some significant advances in uh, gun control. But when those things happen, the NRA and other pro-gun groups continue to fight on and even say, you know, you'll never get this rifle out of my hands except when I'm dead, as uh, Charlton Heston said at the NRA convention about 10 years ago. So repudiating uh, any type of possible defeat. All right, well, let me move on to um, two quick case studies that will try to illustrate at least some of these um, points I've made. Um, first off, let's talk about the use of women's rights in the U.S. war in Afghanistan. And of course, that war began in 2001, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, and it was justified initially as retaliation for uh, uh, the um, al-Qaeda's attacks against the United States and for Afghanistan's harboring of uh, the, the al-Qaeda. But very quickly, within just weeks, in fact, Laura Bush went on national television and talked about the need to bring women's rights to Afghanistan, to the benighted Afghani people. And this became, over time, a more and more important way in which the war in Afghanistan was justified for two de decades. Uh, it was part of a broader effort uh, or justification in terms of democratization and bringing other types of rights as well. But this was in many ways the most important of the rights that were talked about in US, US campaign to uh, maintain the Afghanistan war. And looking at this through the um, lens that I have in this book, I would say that although there were clearly overt goals, which I think were sincere to actually improve the lives of women at, in Afghanistan, that in addition, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that even human rights NGOs, who you might think would think twice about the costs of war, continued to promote this war for decades. Most strikingly in 2011, when uh, President Obama was 
making noises about taking the United States out of the war uh, shortly after the death of Osama bin Laden, when there clearly was an exit time that, that seemed that could have been appropriate. Um, human rights NGOs uh, lobbied hard at the NATO meeting in Chicago and more generally online to keep, so-called keep the progress going on human rights, which essentially meant keep the war going, which we did for another 10 years, but without really achieving much of anything, as many predicted even back in 2001 when Laura Bush made her first statements about this. So I would argue that there were also some covert goals involved here. Uh, one of them was simply to maintain the war for the purpose, as U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan Ryan Crocker stated, uh, to of basically not simply uh, changing Afghanistan in terms of um, uh, not not simply uh, having the Taliban's uh, views of women's rights be submerged and ended, but more generally to change the entire thrust of Afghan society, as he says in this quote, which he terms you know, forces of darkness. Uh, that was not a goal that was stated very publicly. This comes from an interview in a book after Crocker left office, but uh, I think it was a very important covert goal. And another important one, which I talked about in the book at length, is the goal of protecting the US as a potential victim, again, of uh, Afghan society, at least its purported uh, uh, penchants towards violence as indicated by the ways in which women are treated in that society. And this was uh, given a kind of systematic um, view through what Hillary Clinton uh, stated while she was Secretary of State and what came to be known as the Hillary doc Doctrine. There's a book about this uh, doctrine uh, that I, I have a picture of here. Basically, the Hillary Doctrine states that the subjugation of winnie, women anywhere in the world is a direct threat to US national security, anywhere in the world. That, of course, is a claim that is extremely broad, not only because it includes any place in the world, but also because the term subjugation is so vague. But I think that this uh, helps explain, again, why the United States might have stayed in Afghanistan so long. Uh, and uh, it also, of course, opens up the possibility of undertaking military act actions against any number of other traditional societies in which women are quote unquote subjugated. So this is a very important goal and it's one that during the Obama administration, I think played a role in maintaining our presence in Afghanistan, maybe not so much in the Trump administration, but I think this has come back in the Biden administration as well. One way we can see that is the fact that since the conclusion of the uh, military aspects of the war in Afghanistan just a few months ago, the United States has maintained extremely harsh economic sanctions, essentially economic warfare against one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, and again, arguably, this is because of, the, well, what's stated typically is because they are still subjugating women, which is true. But also, I think it has to do with this idea that the United States feels that we need to get rid of the Taliban, change the entire traditional society in order to protect US national security as well, per the Hillary doctrine. Okay, that's the end of, a, again, a very brief case study. Let me talk about one more quickly, and then we'll uh, conclude. Um, in the case of a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, a number of others, um, in the late, uh, 2000s, 2010s, uh, there were a number of very harsh anti-homosexual bills that were passed by these countries. Um, and in doing this, the countries had some support from conservative groups in the West. In fact, the top photo you see there, which is actually on the cover of my Global Right Wing book, shows a Mormon, a US Mormon, protesting in favor of the so-called death to gays law, as it was called by gay rights activists in Uganda. Um, 
But countries like Uganda and Nigeria passed these very, very harsh anti-LGBT laws um, on the basis that this is the right of the majority, that the majority of people in our culture support this. And additionally, that is our right as a state to bring in these types of laws against what they see as a crime or even a crime against humanity as that second photo shows there. Now, I certainly don't accept these views, but these were views that were put forward in making the, uh, these new laws in these countries. One other thing that uh, these countries did at the international level, where at the UN there were strong efforts to promote gay rights and to um, bring in a new concept known as sexual orientation and gender identity, what the countries of many countries of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference did was to basically reject the entire SOGI concept, basically saying that there is no such thing as sexual orientation and gender identity, and therefore no rights can be based upon it. Now, this again had a very violent and nasty aspect to it, as you can see from this uh, headline from a Nigerian newspaper and the protest uh, sign there in, um, in Uganda. Uh, and it rightly, I think, caught the attention of Western publics and Western countries who began all the more, uh, more, more vigorously to promote the SOGI concept at the UN but also at the domestic level to promote aid cutoffs, to threaten aid cutoffs, or to make aid to these poor countries conditional on their rejecting those laws or uh, ending those laws and actually improving LGBT rights. And in making these claims, unsurprisingly, uh, people such as Secretary of State Clinton said LGBT rights are human rights. They made that claim. Uh, they also more generally integrated LGBT rights into all aspects of US foreign policy. And the UK did exactly the same thing. In this conflict, however, um, what the goals that were being achieved were clearly on one hand to protect gay populations in these countries, uh, to change at least overtly only one aspect of these traditional societies. But I'd say covertly, at least in the perception of these African uh, governments, as well as many of the, much of the populace in these countries themselves, there was a covert goal. And it's hard to know whether this is in fact the case, uh, but it's worth at least noting what the targets are saying here. Um, there were, was a poll conducted in Nigeria around the time of this controversy that showed overwhelming support, for better or for worse, for these uh, very harsh anti-gay laws. And African leaders, including those of Uganda, uh, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, made the claim very strongly that their sovereignty was being eroded. That in fact, this was a new form of imperialism or gay imperialism that was being used against these former colonies uh, in, uh, by the West. Now you might not really give much credence to the views of these African leaders who you might see as just homophobic or even the broader African populations in these countries uh, because they too could be perceived as, as very much homophobic. But one additional piece of evidence to suggest uh, that there is some validity to this idea that, that there's, there's covert uh, goals here or that at least these campaigns uh, and aid cutoffs had some very deleterious consequences is, comes from LGBT rights groups in Africa. In a broad coalition of these groups issued a statement about the British aid cutoff saying that this resulted from disproportionate power relations, that it represented gay imperialism as the leaders had said as well, that these kinds of policies that the West was implementing without consulting the gay populations in these countries had terrible collateral damage, namely 
the LGBT populations within these African states themselves who were scapegoated for this foreign intervention into their society. And more generally, they, these LGBT groups uh, argued against the aid cutoffs because they said this kind of aid conditionality would hurt all of their population, all Africans in which aid conditionality was, was actually used. So in this case too, I would say that the rights conflict is, is much more complex than you might assume. Um, and that many of the strategies that uh, we talked about previously in the more theory side of this talk uh, came to the fore here as well. And I think that's a good way to conclude and then open up to questions. Um, my overall argument, and I hope it was illustrated at least in part by these short uh, examples, uh, case studies, as well as the shorter in the talk itself, my overall argument is that rights are not just the goals of politics, but also they are the means and tools and weapons of struggle. They are not just shields, but also swords. They're ag aggressive tools, even dynamite in various political conflicts. That rights, their content is actually indeterminate. We can't simply say this is what the, uh, the tried and true, the only uh, version of what rights are, even as you know, liberals within a liberal society. Uh, all sides in these kind of conflicts will deploy various types of rights. And this kind of conflict is pervasive in any form of politics today, suggesting that rights are by no means indivisible. Again, I didn't really talk about this in detail, but I would argue that uh, rather than rights being inherent in humanity and manifesting themselves in a kind of unidirectional way over time, rights have become more and more popular in part because of their strategic utility in political conflicts today. And finally, I didn't go into this, but we can take maybe this analogy further by talking about the sorts of issues I lay out there very briefly, rights fair or lawfare, which is actually talked about already, rights mongering and rights races between different sides in a conflict. Uh, maybe if these get out of control, rights control. And ultimately, as in the case of other uh, concepts, maybe rights fatigue. And maybe on that, it's a good way to end the, the talk. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Bob, for this uh, very enlightening lecture. Uh, so I think that it would be great if those who are joining with us uh, via Facebook uh, or Zoom, they can just write their questions in the chat box and uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, I have a few things to say, but I'll will, uh, you know, make my comments later. Uh, respecting the kind of work you are doing at the moment, COVID policy. So I'll invite people, those who are there in, uh, in, in the cinema seminar hall to ask their question first, and then we'll go for the virtual. So floor is open for questions and comments. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, uh, a very elaborate map uh, and, and different parts of the world. Uh, Quite, quite insightful. I had two observations. One was around rights and duties. Uh, it seemed to me that what we were suggesting was that the rights claimants or the rights bearers and the duty bearers are two different individuals or groups or populations. But consider the case where they're both the same. And the argument then is Again, a culturalist argument that can be made that duties is what this culture values more than rights. So there's a certain inversion of the rights, duties, claims, uh, but, but about the same individual. So don't focus so much on your rights, focus on your duties. That's another way in which this interplay happens between the two. Uh, certainly we know that in India, that kind of argument is often made. Mm -hmm. The second observation that I had was you know, in your larger conception, uh, whether 
this idea that rights accrue to humans by virtue of being humans versus rights as having been achieved through struggles, I wanted to pose to you, are they necessarily contradictory statements? Or the idea that rights are struggles also need that underlying normative assumption that all humans, by virtue of being humans, have rights. But you need to struggle for it. It's not going to be given to you. So I just wanted to comment on those two things. Great. Uh, if you want to collect some, I can do that, or I can, whatever you prefer. <clears throat> yeah, so I think Anand. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, <clears throat> Bob. That was really very enlightening. Uh, and uh, I liked your analysis uh, as well as your analogies. Uh, um, I think this is, uh, this is something that a lot of uh, the definition of rights and the universality of rights discourse is something that a lot of us struggle with in um especially as you know liberals in in traditional societies let's say so so from a you know from a from a historical perspective if one has an an anti-colonial position um or a post-colonial position um then one would like to ideally you know, defend the tradition in one's own society, right? From a from from a historical perspective, but at the same time, you know, as 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 modern people and especially as liberal people, perhaps as secular people, um, many of us see that there are issues around rights. I mean, we are we are in a sense committed to to the framework of rights, and we see that you know, our societies are patriarchal, uh, for example, or can be very homophobic, can be very Islamophobic, um, and so on. Um, and that, you know, there we struggle, you know, but we, we would like to sort of take one stance as regards a dominating West, whereas we'd like to take a very different stance as regards um, you know what 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 we what we deep down regard as regressive aspects of our own of our own cultures mm -hmm. and and this is i think especially hard for women uh or for women who are feminists um right um and it can be further complicated by geopolitical uh, location not just by historical position of being post-colonial and anti-colonial um so, I mean, even if you look at, at what's happening in Afghanistan, I mean, um, I think clearly one would have a, a lot of concern for the rights of Afghan women, but one would not have any sympathy for America trying to, 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 to fix that situation, uh, you know. Um, so so one, can, one can be equally against the Taliban and, and, and against America, and then where does that leave you, you know, uh, in, in today's world? Um, similarly, for a lot of issues in in Africa, I think um, uh, I think uh, genital mutilation, female genital mutilation, is one of those, and so on. Um, and of course, we we have a raging debate in this country for rights of minorities, uh, and especially to do with uh, freedom of religion and, and religious right. expression, yeah. uh, which are heightening by the day, as as you've probably observed in the last. Uh, you know, just, just the time that you've been here. So um, have you in your scholarly work come across a position that, you know, allows one to be a conscientious objector in all cases, right? In all cases. <laughs> in, all cases in the sense that, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to support the Israeli state for what it's doing to, to the Palestinians. But at the same time, recognizing that perhaps on sexual rights, uh, they are more enlightened than, than their, their Arab countrymen, right? Uh, 
and similarly in Afghanistan. I mean, I, I, you know, I can't in good conscience support the Taliban, but I can't equally in good conscience support the American war against Afghanistan. So um, where do I, you know, what does that do to my position on rights? Uh, and this comes up again and again and again in India. I mean, uh, you know, every possible type of rights that we debate here in this country, whether they have to do with marriage, whether they have to do with sexuality, with gender, with, you know, you name it. Uh, because, you know, it is after all <laughs> a very traditional part of the world in some regards. And it has a very liberal constitution um, uh, in, 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 and, 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 and is essentially a democracy. Um, you know, in 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 uh, purely political perspective. So, what do we do? This one now, and then we'll connect to another okay. set of questions. All right. Well, those are uh, challenging and interesting questions, and uh, hope I can uh, do justice to them. Um, I think, um, Awadhendra, your your questions. Um, <laughs> I think you're right, <clears throat> although I'm certainly no expert on uh, Indian culture, but I certainly believe, as you're suggesting, that uh, maybe this concept of duties comes before rights, at least historically. Uh, and I know this is often put into the context of the so-called Asian values debate, uh, uh, which was uh, not sure how, how hot it is now, but certainly a few years back, <clears throat> um, I think led by Singapore, actually, there was, you know, kind of claim that was made that, you know, duties come before rights. Um, I, I guess I would have two responses to that. One, um, I do think, as, as Ananya was also suggesting, that, the, you know, these are, you know, maybe traditional societies, but also changing societies in which you do have a lot of um, new uh, ideas, new organizations that are in fact promoting individual rights and maybe trying to move away from the uh, duty first approach. Uh, of course, they do often come into conflict with some of the governments in the, in the region. Um, and I guess the other uh, point I'd make is that even if it's true that duties come first, I still think that there is this kind of rights duties um, uh, dichotomy. And I, I guess I'm, it's, as you suggested, or you asked really, you know, could, could it be that someone is both a rights bearer and a duty, or rights uh, claimant and a, a duty bearer? And I'd say yes, definitely. Although I don't think you could be that simultaneously on the same issue. I mean, all of us, I think, have, are, are going to make certain rights claims, maybe against the state, uh, but others, we're, we're also going to have certain duties upon us placed upon us because of the rights of others. Uh, and so you can, I think in this, in, uh, you know, as an individual or as an organization, you are both a rights claimant or right. If you can achieve that um, and a duty bearer. I don't know that, I, I guess I couldn't see that you were, you were both simultaneously on the same issue. I, I'm not sure I can see that, but uh, going back to the, the, the other point, I, I do think that um, you could, uh, e even a, in a society that's more traditional in which duties come first, there is still the such sort of balance involved with, with rights as well. Um, and then the second question was whether, uh, you know, there's really a contradiction between the idea of rights as uh, innately part of uh, human nature uh, or human beings and the, the idea that rights are achieved through political struggle. And I guess in, in some ways, uh, at least from my own personal political standpoint, um, I, I guess I would say, um, I think most rights struggles do require a, um, underlying normative claim. Um, be, but I would say it's mostly in order to um, mobilize your own constituency. I mean, if you think of just a political goal that you might want to achieve, um, let's say back in the 19th century, um, rights, the right to vote for women in the United States. 
Um, that, I mean, you don't necessarily have to see that in moral terms, even though I think you should. Uh, I certainly view it that way, but I don't think that's actually necessary to act to, to have a right. Um, what is necessary is getting a large constituency to fight for that right successfully. Uh, and one way you can build that large constitu constituency is by making the claim that this is, uh, you know, basically part of our nature and there is a morality to it. So it is, that's how I'd answer that question. Maybe I'm sidestepping it slightly, uh, but I do think that, that that's uh, the way I would answer it from this framework. Um, and Ananya's questions, um, yeah, I mean, some of this is, is somewhat similar to the, this, the points that Wadhendra made about, uh, you know, liberalism in a, a traditional society. Um, I think you ultimately, and, and by the way, I, I mean, many of the points you made about, you know, this being a more patriarchal society, probably than the United States, like, maybe not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I'm not, maybe it is, it probably is, but I, I don't know enough about our society. And I think ours, about your society, but our society is, I still has a lot of patriarchal aspects to it. Uh, I guess part of the reason I'm saying this is because I learned last night about the Megalia men's rights movement. And uh, I know that that's very uh, uh, minor thing among some tribal groups there, but uh, that kind of surprised me that, you know, we, this sort of matrilineal society with, apparently women dominating, at least in that one tribal region. But more seriously, um, there's no question that there are a lot of very regressive aspects of uh, American society, of Indian society, and maybe in some ways these are increasing, uh, at least from my own po personal political standpoint and probably from yours, uh, and issues of freedom of religion in particular uh, here, I think are, are particularly um, fraught right now. Um, I mean, the, the, the point you came to at the end was a nice one about what do you do as a, a scholar, a conscientious scholar, you use the word conscientious objector or something like that. Um, and I guess um, I, as a individual, as a voter, as a citizen, I have very, very strong opinions about political issues. And I am quite active in politics, not just by voting, but also, you know, writing op-eds and, uh, you know, debating and so forth um, and contributing to campaigns and so forth. But um, so as a scholar though, I have, I guess maybe scrupulously, some would say too scrupulously tried to be, take an objective viewpoint of things uh, and not, and therefore, you know, to, to you know, as I said here, to take the empirical uh, view of what rights are rather than a normative view, even though I personally would support that normative view in most of these cases. Um, but I try to separate out my scholarship from my politics. And may, many people would say that's not possible or maybe not even advisable. I think it's a good thing to do because even if, if you are still a very much a political animal personally, um, by being objective, you can actually learn a lot more about what your opponents are doing, rather than just sort of writing them off or not studying them. I mean, my previous book on the global right wing, that was one of the first books that looked at how right wing actors were working na internationally and, and also simultaneously nationally on a number of key issues like LGBT rights and, and uh, gun rights and a number of others. Um, and part of the reason I think I was first was because so many other scholars just were so repelled by these groups that they refused to even notice them or certainly to study them, let alone interview them, which I did. Uh, and, and yet I think that that does a disservice to your own cause because you don't understand what they are doing and how to oppose them better in a way. So um, I guess I try in my scholarship to totally divorce myself from my political leanings. Now, I guess I, in some ways, what I've found in some of the uh, research I've done does jibe well with my own politics, like let's say on the Afghanistan case. Uh, I, I totally support what you say about abhorring the Taliban's politics towards women. 
but at the same time, I also abhorred the US war in Afghanistan and thought it was completely the wrong way to achieve rights for women in Afghanistan and probably set them back, in fact, and was instead used as kind of a means of camouflaging a whole range of other objectives. Having the war go on for 20 years rather than ending it really could have been ended immediately or maybe never started. That would have been my real preference. Um, but um, I think the use of women's rights and more generally this idea of democratization and bringing rights uh, was a major reason why the, the war continued so long, why human rights NGOs were supporting more war with all its terrible consequences for all Afghans, most importantly women. Uh, to me, it kind of boggles the mind. So in the end, in that case, and a, and a number of these others, um, my scholarship, I guess, I, it, it, strangely enough, then did comply with my politics. But I, I tried, I think, overall in the book to take a more objective view of how rights are, uh, what, what rights are and how they actually work in politics. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that I'm sure you've been asked multiple times, nevertheless, just to put it on the table, which is to say that, is there a place in your thought of the question of the limits of the rights discourse? Um, one of the, one reason that I ask it is also because of your emphasis on the idea of human rights uh, and the and your contestation of that idea, um, it seems to me that at its limit, rights discourses almost always already invoke something generic and universal, uh, such as human or life, for the simple reason that the rights discourse cannot respond to a number of political claims and political agenda. For example, to take a common one that has always been an unresolved question, at least in South Asian history, which is the question of economic rights. The only version of economic rights that is available in the liberal discourse is of course, right to property. Uh, every other kind of economic right that, or economic, need or desire uh, that is fought over can only happen under the name of an umbrella concept uh, such as human rights or right to life, which while it enables some of those claim makings to let us say win in court perhaps, but it obfuscates the dynamic of what we know as the economic domain, uh, which is where, um, you know, right to property and consumer rights, uh, you know, the economic domain has been resistant to the rights discourse, uh, except via these uh, uh, detours, via human rights or via right to life. Uh, so I'm, in a sense, I'm ask, asking you to also, because all your examples are ideal, typical political, and cultural rights examples. But they also entail killing and you know, life and uh, starvation and famishment. So you see what I'm getting at? I'm saying that, you know, does one also not need to uh, you know, look at where the rights discourse has obfuscated our uh, politics rather than enabled it? Uh, one question in the chat box or rather two. I think you should answer now this one and then we'll take this. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Pratima. Um, the, uh, the um, issue yeah, of obf obfuscating uh, sort of the workings of the economic domain, I guess, uh, that, that's an interesting one. I mean, question, I, I mean, immediately what came to mind is this idea of Right says camouflage, camouflaging, uh, you know, the right to property, camouflaging all the inequality in the economic realm. And this is an old 
idea. I think maybe Marx came up with it first, uh, but you know that you know you, the right to property is in many ways the ultimate camouflage for the capitalist system, if you will. Um, but um, it's I, to me, it's interesting that uh, you know at least at the international realm, and I think to some extent in certain states, probably even India. Uh, you know, there are a set of economic, social, and cultural rights. Certainly at the international level, there's a whole convention of economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, they don't, in some ways, they don't have the same status as civil and political rights. I mean, they're often talked about as rights that we are just going to try to achieve over time to the extent that they can be in an evolving society. That's, you know, not a direct quote, but it's something like that in the uh, I think the preamble to the ICESCR. Um, so, I mean, th there is some discourse about a right to food, right to housing, right to development. I mean, that is out there. Um, I, to me, what is interesting about it is that it's, you know, that it was there in these international conventions long ago but it's become much more prominent in let's say development circles more recently. The right to development has been emphasized. I, I personally am not sure that it's a very effective way to achieve actual economic uh, progress, but I think it's another example of the way in which rights discourse in, at least in the West, because this is very common among Western NGOs for sure. Uh, rights discourse has become so, um, commonplace and it, 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 it's so useful as a way of mobilizing support, if not actually achieving much in, on the ground, but uh, useful as a way to ma of, of maximizing support. So you, you see the concept of rights to X, Y, and Z apply more and more generally in many different places. So uh, I, I think, again, I, I, I did, I have very little about that. It's true in this book. I, I did, I think I talked briefly about the right to development, but uh, it's, it's definitely uh, not a main theme here. Um, I, nonetheless, I'll go out on a limb and uh, say, I, I would hope that the, the same uh, uh, framework that I've developed could apply in that kind of context over rights to development. Uh, I mean, I would guess that, you know, they, they might well come up against the right to property in some cases. You could see a conflict there uh, if you talk about redistribution of wealth to help development or something like that. So um, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay, thanks. So we have three uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, shall I read it or uh, is it? Yeah, the first question is how do you see the human rights violation in Jammu and Kashmir? Uh, by the army. Uh, the second question is about refugees, Syrian refugees or Rohingya. How far can other state help deal with this crisis because they already have their issue to deal with. Uh, and uh, then the last question, could you please also share your views about duties too, since right has been the most significant aspect, but how should we understand duties associated to the concept. Uh, so basically, first two questions are quite specific with regard to a few um, case studies. And the second is a rather uh, related to the conceptual framework you offered. Right. Well, maybe I'll start with the last one from Dr. Ranu Tomar. Thanks for that question. Um, I would say um, you know, the concept of duties, um, it, it's, you know, I, I actually, it's a good point. I, I didn't actually go into that in much detail in this book. And now that I think about it, that would have been an interesting thing to go into far more duty, uh, far more uh, depth on, um, because, I mean, I just basically go with the idea that uh, most individuals and institutions do not want to accept new duties. And so they oppose a rights campaign and they um, 
you know, fight back against it with their own rights claims or these various repudiation strategies that I, that I alluded to. Um, but I think you probably could, but I haven't, uh, go, go into much more about how different sides, especially when they are maybe nearing some kind of compromise, which often has to happen, especially within states, how two sides talk about their respective duties and how they're going to be divided up in this new context of rights that are being developed. Um, so, you know, this actually is sort of similar to some of the other questions I already had here. Um, and probably because I come from the US, I didn't really focus much, and I guess I'd say not enough on what the duty that ends up being imposed would actually be like. And, and so I mean, I think I'll leave my answer to your question right there. It, basically, I, I don't have a good answer to that at the moment. I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Uh, but I would just say that as compromises are eventually reached, even though conflict may still pursue, uh, I think that you're going to see much more of um, uh, discussion about mutual duties among the conflicting parties. Now, the first two questions, which are much more sort of uh, empirical and um, are ones that, uh, I, well, the, the question of refugees, um, let me start with that. I think the rights of refugees are another area of huge conflict in many countries around the world, uh, certainly in, in India, but in the United States, Western Europe as well. And I think those who are promoting the right to asylum um, and um, the right to actually gain permanent residency and citizenship within a country, uh, just like many of the other cases I looked at in this book, face very, very strong opposition from often cultural forces, groups or organizations that claim to represent the pre-existing majority within a society, making claims that, you know, refugees or other types of migrants are going to um, undermine longstanding ideas, mores uh, of the existing population. And so, as you well know, there has been huge conflict about migration, actually for many, many generations, but we see it very prominently right now uh, in many countries. Um, and it, it does pit the kind of the rights of individuals who in many ways are rights less because they have left the countries in which they might potentially even have rights and have entered or are trying to enter countries in which they are not even considered citizens. Um, but it pits those, the rights of, you might say the very weakest of populations against very, very strong opposition in the form of cultural majorities. Um, so I don't know that I have an answer to, to the question itself, but it, I think it's, it's again a, um, example of a um, conflict over rights in which you could see many of the same strategies and approaches being used by both sides to the conflict. I mean, denial of the rights of refugees and uh, cl claims that admitting refugees, giving them rights, are going to undermine the cultural rights of the majority within a society. Um, with regard to Jammu and Kashmir and human rights violations there, uh, I'm going to have to say I don't, I have unfortunately not really followed that sufficiently. Uh, and I, I don't feel that I can really state much about that. Uh, I'm certainly no expert in that area. I've just seen, uh, you know, newspaper reports occasionally about this. It's not an issue, frankly, that gets a lot of prominence in, in the US. And I've only been here in India for about two months. So I guess I'm going to punt on that, that question as well. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few comments to make uh, on your brilliant presentation. Uh, basically, two comments. Uh, the first comment is about uh, your emphasis on the discourse of rights. 
uh, and the manner in which you are using uh, the framework which you offered in the initial part of your presentation to justify them. Now, there is what I find a structural problem. The structural problem is this, that uh, the discourse of right finds a very different political meaning when it is located in the realm of the state agenda. While at the same time, the meaning of soft right will definitely different when they are located in the realm of a movement. Now, what you are actually doing, uh, you are not evoking that distinction very clearly. I have to read the book. I haven't read the book. So that's why this is a comment based on what you just presented. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think this distinction between a movement, the location of the movement, and the meanings of right in the movement uh, need to be specified. And the strategies used by the state to appropriate the discourse of right is entirely different. So that specificity must be spelled out very clearly. So I'll give you one very specific example with regard to your first two points, when you, uh, which, is, which is your approach. We say that rights are achievement of political struggle, obviously. These are. Uh, but in, in the realm of movement, for instance, uh, if you look at the reservation debate in India, uh, obviously these are achievements, but the meanings of the constitution rights given to marginalized communities are expanded rather differently. But on the other hand, when the state would follow the same trajectory or evoking rights, the state is doing exactly the, 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 the different thing. They're not, the state is not exactly doing the same thing state is getting some kind of a legitimacy by evoking that constitutionally these rights are given to you. Therefore, there is a possibility that a state might say that this is charity. So for the people who are struggling at the grassroots level, these things are not charity. These are achievements. While for, from this point of view of a state, this can also be interpreted as charity. So therefore, the specificity of these domain must be specified. That's my first thing. And therefore, I think you also have to make a distinction between movement and NGO, especially international donor agencies and international NGOs. Uh, because that is understandable. Obviously, there is a very close link between uh, dominant NGOs, but we cannot club all NGOs in one category. So therefore, the specific kind, different types of NGOs need to be uh, understood. Now, two comments which you also made, uh, these are very crucial comments uh, in your presentation. Uh, one was that when you were, when um, you were responding to Ananya's question about your position, uh, I think that is not very satisfactory when you say that you divorce yourself from your intellectual agenda and make a comment because in the question then would be, what is your intellectual politics? Obviously you have selected a few things. Obviously you as a political person, you, you cannot separate your intellectual horizon into different compartment. You must have selected a few cases precisely not because of their academic relevance, but their political relevance as well. So therefore you have to specify what kind of intellectual politics you are doing while writing a book. Uh, now, the third comment is also about uh, the overlapping of issues. Again, if we make a distinction between a movement, uh, the location, the right discourse and their location, I think there is a possibility. If in, within the realm of a movement, if the movement is deeply committed for a deep politics, obviously it has to address all the overlapping issues. For example, if a Dalit, uh, movement is going on, certainly, if it is a deep Dalit movement, obviously it has to respond to the economic question. It has to respond to the uh, women's question. It, ca it cannot remain, and, but suppose on the other hand, if it is involved in a shallow politics of identity, then all these issues would be sidelined. So I think that this overlapping, then there's a lot of work on this, by the way. So I think that your macro picture is fascinating, but there is a need to, uh, you know, correlate with the micro specificities. But that's actually very fascinating. Over to you. 
Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah, those are very challenging questions. And um, I guess I'd, uh, I'd say, Something. Oh yeah, yeah. Please. Actually, I think uh, Hilal, Hilal Prasma. Actually, everybody uh, who asked you questions. I mean, it really went to the heart of uh, the the problem from our perspective. So it's, it's it's in response to what you said earlier. I mean, I think it's not about separating one's politics from one's scholarship because you know, that may also be a first world privilege. I don't know. Um, I mean, one may find oneself less able to separate these things in a more engaged academy, such as the one I think we occupy here in this country, because it's largely a system of public institutions and public education. So the academy is not at all divorced, I would say from political realities and from social movements. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, be that as it may, uh, you know, so, so a question of achieving that distance in, in the first place and the objectivity that you talk about, um, you know, it may not arise uh, or it may, be, it may be more complicated than, than it appears. But the other, the other thing I want to say is that as Hilal pointed out, when there are social movements and you want to struggle to achieve uh, you know, a right. So we, we've, we've seen this with, the, with reservations and affirmative action for decades. Uh, we've seen it more recently with uh, LGBTQ rights and gay rights in this country through recent Supreme Court judgments. Mm -hmm. We seem to be uh, making some strides in both those areas, but we are simultaneously regressing as far as the rights of religious minorities are concerned. See, again, this is all happening in a backdrop of um, a struggle for national independence and the, the very achievement of national statehood in the not very distant past, right? right? So in all events, everybody is committed to the idea of self-determination and autonomy and freedom and rights of various kinds, right? But at the same time, there is a longer history of uh, certain kinds of uh, group uh, gr conceptions of identity that are group based and not individual right. based or that are community based and not, uh, you know, not centered on, on the individual, whether male or female or any, you know, gendered in any other way or, or however you might put it, mm -hmm. uh, or qualified by, by any kind of vector of, of identity. Uh, which is not always voluntary or ascriptional, uh, you know, uh, something like caste is very complicated, right? Uh, in terms of what it means for your rights. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't exist in some pure, pure political space uh, where you're simply an Indian national and that's it, an Indian citizen, right? So, um, so I think, you know, coming from a place where you see that you have to struggle to achieve rights, that rights are not simply sort of given to you on a plate. What Hilal is asking is, you know, from the state's perspective, you know, it, it, it can withhold or it can grant. And, and that, that always, you know, is, 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 is cast as, as, as the sort of state's benevolence. Uh, whereas it's anything but that. So you know, one is always one is always mm. warring over <clears throat> rights in, in in a country like this. Yeah. Um, Ours too. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. You're right because you know, I mean, looking recent, just recently at at abortion, the abortion debate, and the right to life debate, and the gun gun debates in the U.S. You know, and numerous other issues. and numerous numerous other issues. It suddenly begins to to seem much you know much less developed than than, <laughs> than you know one 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 would have imagined uh, from a liberal perspective. Certainly. Yeah, great. Um, and I think, by the way, one of the reasons it may be is surprising to you is again because scholars, I think 
many of them who are being liberal. I, there's no question I myself consider myself a liberal, I think overwhelmingly in the US, have focused more on the causes that they like and they support. And so it then can come as a surprise when you have uh, you know, all the movements you've just talked about, or when you have a Trump who's elected or a Brexit or something like that. You know, it becomes a surprise because I think of the intellectual blinders that often we have if we um, you know, don't look at the sides we don't like. <laughs> Uh, and I, like I, I often said, I, you know, I was, I was holding my nose while I was interviewing these people on the right in that other book that I was doing, uh, because I did not like their politics, but I felt like I needed to understand what they were saying, how they, what the source of their belief was, what they, uh, what their strategies were, because, well, A, I found it interesting, but B, I ultimately thought, you know, if we can understand this better, then that can help advance our own causes better and, you know, prepare us for things like a Trump, uh, for sure. Um, so, um, so yeah, the, yeah, these questions and interesting, and frankly, I have not gotten ones like this from American audiences. Um, I, I would, I'd say um, one response I'd have is that I don't remember who it is, but some very eminent scholar talked about two types of scholarship. One is kind of uh, joining together a whole bunch of different concepts into one, uh, you know, broader concept and others are splitters who want to look at uh, things in much more detail. Uh, and certainly I would say, yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's maybe not quite that, but it's something along those lines. This book I consider to be a, one of kind of a joining book in which I am trying to take a very broad view of what rights are. And in fact, you know, I started out by focusing on human rights, which is most of what people focus on in um, international relations anyway. Uh, but I decided I really could not only look at human rights, I had to make it much broader to look at rights generally. And that's why the definition comes from Wesley Holfeld, who was talking about rights at a time when human rights weren't even really a concept, really didn't come into major play until after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so uh, that's part of this whole joining idea. And I, I think we can learn a lot when we do take this kind of broad view. Uh, at the same time, you're absolutely right that your, your power position makes an enormous difference in how you can uh, implement your rights discourse and way more than rights discourse. Because let's face it, the kind of campaigns I'm talking about don't just involve rhetoric of rights. They involve often you know, physical violence or even war, as I talked about in uh, some of my cases. So um, it's, it's, you know, there's no question that the position of power you have makes enormous difference in how the rights strategies play themselves out. Yet I find it quite interesting that place, uh, countries like the United States, you know, the most powerful country in the world, fighting one of the most, the weakest countries in the world, Afghanistan, has to deck itself out in this rights door discourse again and again for years and years. So I, I think there's something important about that. Uh, and, and interestingly as well, it is not the state alone that's doing it. It is, they're joined by human rights NGOs, international ones primarily, although also Af domestic Afghan ones, many of them. Although in my book, I do quote a number of Afghan women's activists who are not, weren't on, yeah, I, I, being facetious here, but weren't on the American aid dollar or something and were, uh, you know, extremely critical in kind of the way, uh, Ananya, you alluded to before about the war and its ability, even in theory, to bring rights to women. I mean, I think trying to bring uh, Western concepts of liberal women's rights uh, at the point of a gun from the outside into a culture like Afghanistan is never possibly going to work. Um, but yet, human rights NGOs, at least international ones, bought into it. And maybe, you know, the domestic 
Afghan ones bought into it because they were bought off, maybe. I don't know. I think many of the women actually did believe in it and believed it could happen. But there were also very important voices that challenged that completely, which I, I do talk about in the book. Didn't really go into in this, in this talk. Um, so yes, I think you do need to split these things to really understand um, the different ways in which they play themselves out in actual political conflicts. I mean, I, I kind of felt like, and you haven't read the book, but in the detailed case studies that I do in the book, I try to do that a bit more. Uh, the theory, of course, is much broader. And I do, I would, you know, I, I make no bones about the fact that I am trying to promote a concept of rights that can apply across the board to all kinds of institutions and ent entities, knowing nonetheless that there are so, so many differences among them. Um, let me see if it, oh yeah, and then one other slightly different aspect of this that you brought out was um, <clears throat> that movements for one issue must respond to various other issues often, you know, because of overlapping issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly, which is a very, very interesting uh, insight. And I, you know, I do talk about that a little bit. I, I was actually thinking of doing a separate article or maybe even a book just about that kind of issue, because it is a very tough one. And, um, it's the mechanism by the, or it's sort of the basis on which wedge politics can work to try to you know, break down these, these different coalitions because as political animals, all of us uh, and certainly organizations are asked to take positions on a wide variety of issues. So doing so can have political implications for your own cause. Um, I mean, in some of the other work I've done, uh, I've seen movements who want, who, who you know, deliberately and uh, publicly say, we need to remain silent about this other issue, which is kind of tangential to our own, because we want to continue appealing to a broad tent for our issue. Um, so uh, I, I think, um, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, you know, I, I do think some, in some cases, movements will try to take a stance on similar issues, you know, this whole concept of intersectionality is an important one that has become very prominent today. But the, the problem I see, and this goes to the whole idea of blockades, is that often there are conflicts between these movements, even though they may not be overt at one particular moment, they can arise later. Uh, maybe the best example of this of the ones I went over is the trans rights issues today, which in some ways came out of or was very closely associated with at least wings of the women's movements going back many decades, so even though it was much less prominent than it has been in the last five years. But since it's risen to prominence in some ways alongside and with the women's rights movements, it's also increasingly come into conflict with them. And very vicious conflict right now. And all the same thing happened, by the way, with the voting rights movements of the 19th century. And I go into a lot of detail about this in, in the US case where, you know, there were uh, initially, the earliest of these was actually the right to vote for those who were, who had relatively little property or were propertyless. And they did not want to have anything to do with the nascent women's suffrage movements. And the women's suffrage movements to some extent grew up with the abolitionist movement and many were uh, in both uh, movements simultaneously. But then, as I said, as they matured as one of these wings, the you know abolitionist movement succeeded not only in ending slavery, but also in getting votes for black men, then the women's rights movement, women's vote movement of the time became very vicious towards African-American right to vote. And we're really trying to leverage their own rights by saying, you give us these rights and we will subvert the whatever power the African-American vote has. And so there was a lot of intersectionality there, but it kind of broke down over time in the end. Um, so I, I hope that that can answer your, your points. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful evening and um, great Thank presentation. You.
so on behalf of csds i thank you and thank you all those who have joined us on facebook so thank you very much thank you thank you we really enjoyed it thank you thank you